Hello friends, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Scripture. My name is Stephen Cook, and today we're going to pick up in our continued study of tares among the wheat, living righteously in a fallen world. Uh, now last time we met, we talked about positive and negative volition uh, as it's presented in the Word of God, and we looked at a number of scriptures pertaining to that. And today's lesson is going to be somewhat of an extension of that uh, as we talk about negative volition uh, gone to its logical end. And this is the view of atheism. And we'll talk about the despair of atheism and the hope of Christianity. Now, I'm going to recommend a few other books. Uh, one, and I will post links in the description below for these, one is called The Universe Next Door. The Universe Next Door by Dr. James Sire. And I read this book a few years back, and it's a really well-written book. And I think Dr. Sire does a really good job of presenting the differing worldviews. I recommend this. This is a, a very, very good book. Another book that I'm going to recommend is the Francis Schaeffer Trilogy. Trilogy. Now, I have his complete works, the complete works of Francis Schaeffer, which includes the trilogy, but I will post a link in the description below for the trilogy. And the trilogy uh, consists of three books. It consists of The God Who Is There, Escape From Reason, and He Is There and He Is Not Silent. And uh, that's a, a very, very helpful book as well. Uh, there's another book by Francis Schaeffer that I'm going to recommend, and I will post a link in the description below, and it's his book called How Should We Then Live? The Rise and Decline of Western Thought and Culture. How Should We Then Live? And I think that is a book that every Christian should read. I'm going to put that at the very top of the list. <clears throat> so if you read any of these, I'm going to recommend that one. He also did a 10-part video series uh, that, uh, that came out of the book. And uh, each, each of the videos are about 30 minutes long, so they're not long to watch. Uh, and the video series, uh, I believe, is uh, free online. You can watch it now online. And I will post a link to that as well. Now, the series is, is a little dated. It was done back in the early 80s, uh, and you can tell that by the, by the fashion and the, uh, the uh, uh, culture around. But the content of what Dr. Francis Schaeffer sets forth is pure gold. I mean, it's just absolutely pure gold. And so I'm going to recommend uh, that as well, and I'll put that in the description below. Another book that I'll mention <clears throat> that I'll post a link to, uh, a man that I'll be uh, referencing throughout this lesson, is Jean-Paul Sartre, the French existentialist. And he did a little book. It's a very thin little book, so it's not much of a read. But it's existentialism and human emotions. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so if you're going to read unbelief, I recommend reading it by people who uh, understand it and write very uh, clearly about it. And this is, a, this is a helpful little book. Another book that I'll put in the description below is The Humanist Manifesto. The Humanist Manifesto. And it uh, also presents atheism um, very clearly. And so I'll present that there uh, in the description below as well. Now, moving into the lesson, uh, as we grow and develop mentally, we develop a worldview, which is a biased perspective on life. And by the way, everybody has a biased perspective on life. Nobody is neutral, okay? So as we grow, we develop a worldview, which is a biased perspective on life. Now, a worldview, a worldview is a mental framework of beliefs that guide our understanding of what is. It's the assumptions we employ to help us make sense of the world, ourselves, and our experiences. Now, early in life, when our perception of the world is being shaped, we are influenced by the worldviews of family, friends, and surrounding culture. And as we grow older, we are confronted with different and opposing worldviews via religious and educational institutions, literature, movies, music, and art. Now, at some point in our development, and it's different for each person, we choose what we believe and why. Our worldview is important because it's the basis for our values which influence our relationships, money habits, 
social and political decisions, and everything we say and do. Now, at its core, there are basically two worldviews a person can have. Either one is a theist, or one is an atheist. Now, choices have consequences, and the biblical worldview that we adopt has far-reaching ramifications. The biblical worldview offers value, purpose, and hope. The atheistic worldview, when followed to its logical conclusion, and I'm careful to say that, when followed to its logical conclusion, leads to a meaningless and purposeless life that eventuates in despair. The atheist worldview denies the existence of God and believes, and it is, by the way, a faith that they have. Uh, so the atheist worldview denies the existence of God and believes the universe and earth happened by a chance explosion billions of years ago. And rather than intelligent design, he believes in really unintelligent chaos and that the earth, with all of its complexity in life, is merely the product of accidental evolutionary processes over millions and literally billions of years. Now, when evolutionism, when evolutionaristic idea first uh, became popular, um, uh, the scientists pushed back millions of years. But as time went on, they went back billions. And the most recent estimate I've heard uh, that they push is somewhere between 13 and 16 billion years. And they need deep time. They need lots of time. Because they believe that everything that exists is the product of matter, motion, time, and chance. And you can't just have matter. Matter must be in motion for chemistry to work. And then you need time and just random chance for this to happen. That's their, that's their understanding. So his worldview believes everything is, the pro is, is merely the product of matter, motion, time, and chance and that we are the accidental collection of molecules, and that we are nothing more than evolving bags of protoplasm who happen to be able to think and feel and act. The conclusion is that we came from nothing significant, that we are nothing significant, and we go to nothing significant. Ultimately, there is no reason for us to exist, and no given purpose to assign meaning to our lives. Ultimately, according to their worldview, mankind is just a zero. Now, this leads to a certain amount of tension and anxiety and despair. And this is why I recommend uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, existentialism and human emotions, because he, he seeks to address this. Um, because if you start with a purely materialistic universe, uh, and if there is no intelligent designer and no God to give us purpose and value and meaning to our lives or direction to our lives, then how do you deal with that despair? And I appreciate that he at least attempts to deal with it. And his answer in dealing with it is that we create our sense. We create a sense of purpose and meaning through an act of the will. Now, that can be an irrational act of the will, but just simply an act of the will uh, can give us a sense of purpose and meaning in life. Now, I think ultimately that's a bankrupt uh, um, philosophy, um, but nonetheless, he, that's, his, that's his answer to that. Uh, and we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. Now, some have thought through the logical implications of their atheism, and they understand this well. And I'm going to quote two people here. One is Mark Twain, and the other is Bertrand Russell. But quoting Mark Twain, he says, quote, A myriad of men are born. They labor and sweat and struggle for bread. They squabble and scold and fight. They scramble for little mean advantages over each other. Age creeps upon them. Infirmities follow. Shames and humiliations bring down their prides and their vanities. Those they love are taken from them, and the joy of life is turned to aching grief. The pain of burden, care, misery grows heavier year by year. At length, ambition is dead. Pride is dead. Vanity is dead. Longing for release is in their place. It comes at last, the only unpoisoned gift ever had for them. And they vanish from a world where they were of no consequence, where they achieved nothing, where they were a mistake and a failure and a foolishness, where they have left no sign that they have existed. 
a world which will lament them a day and forget them forever. Then another myriad takes their place and copies all they did and goes along the same profitless road and vanishes as they vanished to make room for another and another and a million other myriads to follow the same arid path through the same desert and accomplish what the first myriad and all the myriads that came after it accomplished. Nothing. <laughs> what, a, what a despairing view. Now, Bertrand Russell, and again, I'm quoting men here who have thought through the logical implications of their atheism and have really followed it to its logical end. And they come to that place where there's just despair. I mean, because there's really nothing else. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Now, Bertrand Russell says, quote, man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving that his origin, his growth, his hope and fears, his loves and beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocation of atoms, that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual beyond the grave, that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruin. All things, he goes on to say, all things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy that rejects them can hope to stand. And notice his closing comment here. He says, only within the scaffolding of these truths only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. <clears throat> what, a, what a despairing place, right? What a dark place. Now, no God, their belief in no God, means that we live in a purely materialistic universe. Logically, materialism leads to nihilism which teaches that life is meaningless. And again, I go back to Sartre and others, Aldous Huxley and others, uh, who sought to wrestle with this, who, who attempted to, to try to find some truth and some meaning and some purpose in life. Now, ultimately, if there is no God, then each of us are nothing more than the accidental collection of molecules, that all of our thoughts, desires, passions, and actions can be reduced to electrical chemical impulses in the brain and body. We are nothing more than a biochemical machine in an accidental universe. And when we die, our biological life is consumed by the material universe from which we came. But this really leaves us in a bad place, doesn't it? For we instinctively search for meaning and purpose to understand the value of our lives and our actions. This tension leads to a sense of anxiety what the German philosopher Martin Heidegger called angst. And again, I'm going to reference back to Sartre because he addresses this in his book. He addresses the subject of, of angst. Now, angst and fear are different. For fear has a direct object, whereas angst is that innate and unending sense of anxiety or dread that one lives with and cannot shake. Now, the French existentialist philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, understood this worldview and the despair connected with it. And Sartre proposed that an individual, that individual purpose could be obtained by the exercise of our wills, as we choose to act, even if the act is absurd. Now, Francis Schaeffer addresses uh, Sartre's view, and he says of Sartre, quote, Sartre held that in the area of reason, everything is absurd. But nonetheless, a person can authenticate himself by an act of the will. Everyone should abandon the pose of spectator and act in a purposeless world. But because, uh, as Sartre saw it, reason is separated from this authenticating, the will can act in any direction. Uh, Schaefer goes on, he says, on the basis of his teaching, you could authenticate yourself either by helping a poor old lady along the road at night or by speeding up your auto and running her down. 
Reason, says Schaefer, is not involved, and nothing can show you the direction which your will should take, end quote. And again, uh, because they hold to a form of, because they're atheistic, uh, there is no ultimate truth because there is no ultimate truth giver. There are no absolute or final morals in the universe because there's no absolute moral law giver. And so one is then left in just a sea of opinion. You're really just kind of left up to yourself to slug it out and to try to find some sense of purpose and meaning and direction in this life. But you're really lost in a universe that is meaningless. It's really, again, quite a despairing place. Now, I would argue that most atheists really don't want to talk about the logical conclusion of their position. And really, most choose to go about their daily lives ignoring the issue altogether, as it's too painful, really, to consider. And this is why Sartre ultimately abandoned reason and advocated that we seek for meaning in the choices we make, even if those choices are irrational or even absurd. Aldous Huxley, another uh, philosopher, proposed using psychedelic drugs with the idea that one might be able to find truth and meaning inside his own head. Talking about Aldous Huxley, Francis Schaeffer states, quote, He held this view up to the time of his death. He made his wife promise to give him LSD when he was ready to die so that he would die in the midst of a trip. All that was left for Aldous Huxley and those who followed him was truth inside a person's own head, end quote. But there is another implication to an atheistic worldview, and that's in the area of morals. If there is no God, then there is no moral lawgiver outside of mankind, and no moral absolutes by which to declare anything ethically right or wrong. There is only subjective opinion, which fluctuates from person to person and group to group. Ultimately, we're left to conclude that if there are no moral absolutes, then what is, is right. And at that moment, the conversation is really over. Now, morality becomes a matter of what the majority wants or what an elite or individual can impose upon others. Quoting Francis Schaeffer again, and here I'm quoting from his, I've been quoting from his book, How Should We Then Live, a book that I strongly recommend. If you don't have it or haven't read it, then uh, please sometime along the way, include that in your library of books to read. You'll, you'll be blessed by it. Or watch the video series. Uh, the video series is, is brilliant. I, again, I highly recommend it. So quoting Francis Schaeffer again, he says, quote, If there is no absolute moral standard then one cannot say in a final sense that anything is right or wrong. By absolute, we mean that which always applies, that which provides a final or ultimate standard. He goes on, he says, there must be an absolute if there are to be morals, and there must be an absolute if there are to be real values. If there is no absolute beyond man's ideas, then there is no final appeal to judge between individuals and groups whose moral judgments conflict. We are merely left with conflicting opinions." End quote. Now, ironically, and think about this, ironically, when the atheist states there is no truth, he's actually making a truth claim. And when he says there are no absolutes, <laughs> He's actually stating an absolute. Logically, he cannot escape truth and absolutes, without which reason, reasoning and discussion are simply impossible. Now, the biblically-minded Christian celebrates both truth and absolutes which derive from God himself, in which he declares some things right and other things wrong, and this according to his righteousness. Now, the atheistic worldview, the, atheist, uh, the atheistic view regards mankind as merely a part of the animal kingdom. But if people are just another form of animal, a naked ape, as, some, as someone once described, then there's really no reason to get upset if we behave like animals. A pack of wild, a pack of wild lions in the Serengeti 
suffer no pangs of conscience when they gang up on a helpless baby deer and rip it to shreds in order to satisfy their hunger pains. They would certainly not be concerned if they drove a species to extinction. After all, it's survival of the fittest. Let the strong survive and the weak die off, is the view of uh, evolutionaryism and survival of the fittest. Now, evolution could also logically lead to racism, which is implied in Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. And by the way, if you look at the original title of Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, it has a subtitle, which most modern uh, books, most modern versions of that, remove the subtitle. And you wonder, okay, what's going on there? But his original uh, book, titled The Origin of Species, had the subtitle, uh, which mentions the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Uh, and so to me, there's, there's, a, there's some uh, logical racism going on there. Now, ironically, we teach evolution in public schools, telling children that they are just another animal species, but then ironically get upset when they act like animals toward each other. And really, we can't have it both ways. We can't logically teach atheistic evolution and simultaneously advocate for morality. It's a non sequitur. That is, it, it doesn't follow. If there are no moral absolutes, then one cannot describe as evil the behavior of Nazis who murdered millions of Jews in World War II. Neither can one speak against the murder of tens of millions of people under the materialistic communistic regimes of men like Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, or Pol Pot. Again, if there is no absolute moral lawgiver, then, then there are no absolute moral laws. And at that point, really, if somebody says they like or don't like something, all they're doing is really giving you a personal psychology report. That's all it is, and nothing more. And we're just simply left in a, in a sea of opinion where everybody's expressing their own thoughts and feelings, but there's no ultimate standard to declare anything right or wrong. And this, is, this leaves people in a very, very dark spot. And what's ironic, and again, I find it amazing, that I will talk with an atheist and they will talk about, well, you should do this or this ought to be. Well, excuse me, where do you get your shoulds? And where do you get your oughts? Why should something be right or wrong? Or why ought we to do this or that? Where do you, where do you get your morals? Where do you get your ethics? You know, you argue for uh, atheism, that we live in a purely materialistic universe, that everything is the product of matter, motion, time, and chance, that we're just evolving bags of protoplasm, accidental collection of molecules. So where do you get your morals? Where do you get that from? And how do you get this sense of should and ought? Because as soon as somebody uses the words should and ought, they're expressing their morality and uh, their standards of right and wrong. And so I, I immediately go back and I say, well, where do you get that from? You know, and ultimately they have nothing more than themselves upon which to base that or a majority. But that majority can shift. The, certainly the majority in uh, Nazi uh, Germany in the late 30s and early 40s, uh, I mean, their view of, uh, of racism against the Jews, uh, I mean, that was the moral uh, opinion at that time. And so if we say, well, it's based on the, on the moral majority, well, you, excuse me, the moral majority can be wrong. They can be absolutely wrong. But again, I come from a theistic worldview where there is, where God does exist and where he is there and he is not silent and he has spoken. And that which he has revealed about himself in the universe has been inscripturated. And so we go to the word of God as a clear revelation uh, of God and his word. Now, it's interesting that people cry out uh, and, and watch people, watch, watch the news, uh, listen to the stories. It's interesting that people cry out for personal and social justice. And they cry out that way because they're naturally wired that way. But for the atheist, such inclinations are either a learned behavior based on arbitrary social norms or merely a biological quirk that developed from accidental evolutionary processes. Again, we're left with no moral absolutes and no meaning for life. 
Naturally, for the thinking person, this leads to despair. And for this reason, some seek pleasure. They seek to just simply numb themselves. Uh, some seek for pleasure in drugs or alcohol, partying, and or sexual promiscuity in order to deaden the pain of an empty heart. And others move into irrational areas of mysticism and the occult. And I think of the Burning Man events, if you've never seen or heard of those, uh, the Burning Man events are a good example of this. Now, the few honest atheists, such as Twain, Russell, and others, accept their place of despair and seek to get along in this world as best they can. But ultimately, they have no lasting hope for humanity. None whatsoever. But the Christian worldview is different. The biblically-minded Christian has an answer in the Bible, which gives lasting meaning and hope. And this allows us to use our reasoning abilities as God intended. You see, the Bible presents the reality of God. And by the way, the Bible really doesn't seek to prove the existence of God. It doesn't really seek to prove the existence of God. It assumes the existence of God. And this is why even in Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the Bible presents the reality of God, who has revealed himself to all people, to all people. In fact, Psalm 19, 1 and 2 says the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Now, the Apostle Paul argued this point in Romans 1, 20, when he said, For since the creation of the world... His, that would be God, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, have been clearly seen. And don't miss that. There's no problem with the revelation, none whatsoever. It has been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Now, this is called general revelation in which God reveals himself through nature. God has also revealed himself to the heart of every person. In Romans 1.19, Paul says, For that which is known about God, not guessed at, that which is known about God is evident within them, for God himself made it evident to them. Now, if God makes himself evident to somebody, there's no ambiguity there. It is clearly understood. I'm going to reference John Calvin here, and I like some of what Calvin uh, presents in his writings. There's quite a bit of his material I don't particularly care for and don't agree with him on, but I did think he, get, he got this one right. Now, Calvin wrote, and here I'm quoting from his Institutes, he says, There exists in the human, in the human minds, and indeed by natural instinct, some sense of divinity. He further states, uh, and okay, so this is what is referred to as the sensus divinitatis. Sorry, I missed this. So John Calvin referred to this as the sensus divinitatis, that is the sense of the divine, which is an innate sense of divinity, an intuitive knowledge that God exists. So Calvin wrote, there exists in the human minds and indeed by natural instinct some sense of deity. He further states that all men of sound judgment will therefore hold to a sense of deity is indelibly engraved on the human heart. Now, part of uh, Calvin's argument is based on God's special revelation in Scripture. But part of his uh, observation is also based on human experience. Calvin wrote, there never has been... <clears throat> from the very first year, any quarter of the globe, any city, any household even, without religion, which amounts to a tacit confession that a sense of deity, <clears throat> excuse me, is inscribed on every heart, end quote. So the idea here is that mankind universally and historically seeks after God. Therefore, God must exist because the creature does not crave that which does not exist. <clears throat> Excuse me again. So again, because mankind historically and universally seeks after God, God must exist because the creature does not crave 
that which does not exist. <clears throat> Excuse me again, I'm losing my voice. So the problem is not with God's clear revelation, but with the human heart, which is negative to him. <clears throat> For those possessed with negative volition have as their habit, as Paul says in Romans 1.18, to suppress the truth in unrighteousness to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And the reality is that there's no problem with the truth or with the revelation. It's that people who are set to negative mode in their volition, that they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So the problem lies in the sinful heart that suppresses that revelation from God in order to pursue one's sinful passions. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 1, 21 to 23, he says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened, and professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Now, moving on, however, God himself is a perfect gentleman, and he never forces himself upon anybody. People are free to choose whether to accept him or not. But if they reject what light God gives of himself, he is not obligated to give them any further light, as they will only continue to reject it. Of those who are negative to God, three times it is said in Romans chapter 1 that he gave them over to the lusts of their heart, to degrading passions, and to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Once God permits a person to operate by his sinful passions, he is given a measure of freedom to live as he wants, but not without consequence. Now, God does not render final judgment upon the rebellious right away. Rather, God extends to them a common grace, which refers to the undeserved kindness or goodness, which he extends to everyone, regardless of whether they are righteous or unrighteous, good or evil. God's common grace is seen in his provision of the necessities of life, sun, rain, air, food, water, clothing, etc., uh, and this grace depends totally on God and not, the act, and not the attitude or actions of others. Jesus said in Matthew 5.45, uh, he said of his father that he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. This is called common grace that God extends to everybody. Now, Paul affirmed this grace in Acts 14, verses 16 and 17, where Paul says, In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good, and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Now, in Paul's quote here, we see God's grace is most obvious in that he provides the necessities of life and even blesses those who are unsaved and hostile toward him. His love and open-handedness toward the undeserving springs completely out of the bounty of his own goodness. Now, part of the reason that God is gracious and patient, as 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us, is that he is not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. However, uh, let me be very clear here. Though grace, I would say, is infinite in scope, it is not eternal in its duration. There is a time when grace comes to an end. And grace ends when the unbeliever dies. And if he or she has spent his entire life, have spent their entire lives rejecting Christ as Savior, then afterward they will stand before God's judgment seat and if his name in Revelation 2015, if, if their name is not found written in the book of life, then they will be thrown into the lake of fire, where they will be forever. This final judgment is avoidable. It's all avoidable if Jesus is accepted as one Savior. 
The Bible reveals in John 3, 16 through 18, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, to the heart that is positive to God and turns to Christ as Savior, he has revealed himself in special ways in his Son, Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 says that, that God, after, after he spoke long ages ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So God has spoken to us through his Son. He has also spoken to us through his written word, through the scripture. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he says, For this reason we also constantly thank God, that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. In other words, God had revealed himself to certain men throughout history. And what he had revealed about himself had been written down. And God the Holy Spirit superintended their writings in such a way that without compromising their personality or literary style or choice of words, that what they wrote in the end was exactly what God intended for them to write, such that the end result is not the word of man, but it is in fact the word of God. And by the way, the Bible is really, when one holds the Bible, it's really a library. It's a collection of 66 books and letters written by roughly 40 uh, authors, human authors, spanning a period of roughly 1,500 years. And again, these men wrote in such a way uh, that their work was superintended by God the Holy Spirit uh, that guaranteed that what they wrote in the end was ultimately uh, the Word of God. Now, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says all Scripture is inspired by God. And the word Scripture there translates the Greek word graphe, graphe, which refers to the written word. So all Scripture is inspired by God, or is literally theopneustos, or God-breathed. It, is, it is, originates from the very source of God. And it is profitable. You see, it's beneficial to us for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, God's special revelation gives us insight into realities that we could never know on our own, except that God has revealed them to us in his word in propositional terms. Now, as we read the Bible in a plain manner, and I argue for a plain, literal, historical, grammatical reading of the Bible, just reading it in a plain way, that we come to realize that God exists as Trinity, or Triunity, as some say, uh, that, God, that there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and that all three persons are, uh, of the Trinity are co-equal, co-infinite, and co-eternal, and worthy of all praise and honor and glory. Now, the Bible also reveals that God personally created his universe and earth in six literal days. That's six 24-hour days. Now, some say, well, that's, you know, that's awful quick. No, not really. <laughs> if we're honest, uh, God could have simply spoke and brought everything into existence in a nanosecond. But the fact that he did it over a period of six days, I believe, was didactic. I believe it was instructional, because later on in Exodus, uh, God is going to set forth the work week for the Israelite under the Mosaic law, and they were a theocracy, uh, the only theocracy to exist, to the only theocracy to have existed in the history of the human race. And uh, Moses writes, he says, "Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work." 
But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant. And this even extended to the animals uh, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. And then comparing the six-day work week to the six-day creation, Moses says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now some people will say, well, the days represent ages or millions or billions of years. Forget all that nonsense. Listen, you could never come to that by a simple reading of Genesis chapter 1. You couldn't. Uh, because it talks about morning and evening, 24-hour time frame. Uh, it uses the Hebrew word yom for day, but it, it, it attaches with that Hebrew numerals, like uh, the first day or the second day or the third day. And when you have that construction, again, that argues for a literal day, a 24-hour day, uh, so the Bible reveals that God personally created the universe and earth in six literal days. The Bible also teaches that God created the first humans, Adam and Eve, in his image, with value and purpose to serve as theocratic administrators over the earth. As people, we have the ability to reason because we are made in the image of God, We also, uh, who also gave us language as a means of communicating with him and with each other. And I go back to when God created Adam and he formed him from the dust of the earth. And then God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the immaterial part of man. And at that moment, the coalescence of that immaterial and material became uh, the first man. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul or a living being. God immediately began to engage in conversation. So God had imputed within the mind of man um, a bank of vocabulary, of words and phrases and concepts, such that literally seconds after Adam was created, God could immediately enter into dialogue with him. And so God himself communicated with the other members of the Trinity. All the members of the Trinity communicated amongst each other. And so language exists, uh, exists in God prior to the creation of anything. And so God himself is the source of language as a means of communicating with him and with each other. And even my communicating with you now, as you watch this video or you listen to this podcast, uh, I am operating on the assumption that language serves as a reliable vehicle for the expression of ideas. And that as I formulate thoughts in my mind, and I verbalize that, and it's recorded digitally and transmitted through the airways, your mind, your ears pick up on those sounds, uh, those distinct sounds, and your brain, in your mind, you have a bank of vocabulary of words uh, and phrases, and so you are able to understand what I am saying. And so we are able to do this thing called communication. And if I introduce new words or concepts, I am able to define them in such a way so as to create uh, new uh, words that are part of your bank of vocabulary of words and phrases. And so communication is one of those things that can expand over time. Now, God also, the Bible teaches that God also created a host of spirit beings called angels. Uh, but one of them, Lucifer, rebelled against God and convinced the other angels <clears throat> and convinced other angels to do the same. Uh, the Bible reveals that fallen angels are called demons. Sometimes they're called evil spirits or wicked spirits who belong to Satan's ranks. And I've mentioned this before, so I'm not going to chase down these scripture references at the moment. But these demons influence the world of people in many ways in their thinking, values, and behavior. And so the Bible reveals that there is an invisible realm where there are angels and demons that exist that influence politics, uh, culture, music, literature, art, theater, uh, all aspects of our lives. Uh, I would argue that in many ways they have infected the academic uh, world, our universities and educational systems. Uh, through the promotion of their atheistic uh, ideas, 
And these have consequences, and we see our society moving downward, spiritually, morally, and we're, America's headed in a, in a pretty, pretty dark direction. We're headed in a pretty bad direction. And unless there is a turn, unless there is a shift uh, back to a Judeo-Christian worldview, I think, I think we're headed in a, in a real bad, uh, in a real bad uh, direction. So again, fallen angels, and I simply point this out because they operate in such a way that they're able to impact the world in which we live. Uh, and so these belong to Satan's ranks, and they influence the world of people in many ways in their thinking, values, and behavior. And Lucifer came to earth and convinced the first humans to rebel against God, that he took rulership of the earth, and expanded his kingdom of darkness to include all unbelievers. Adam and Eve's sin brought about spiritual death, that is, separation from God, in time. And God cursed the earth as a judgment upon them. And that's why we see uh, sin and sickness and death upon the earth because of these things. Now, God's judgment also explains why everything moves toward decay and physical death. That is the second law of thermodynamics. But God, because of his great mercy and love toward us, provided a solution to the problem of sin and spiritual death. And this through a redeemer who would come and bear the penalty for our sins. Now, this Redeemer was Jesus Christ, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, who became human, who added humanity to himself. In the beginning, John 1 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John 1 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace. And truth. Not only that, but Jesus lived a sinless life. Second Corinthians five twenty one says, "He who knew no sin became sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him." Hebrews four fifteen says, "For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin." And 1 John 3, 5 says, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Not only that, but Jesus came into the world, uh, and he came to die willingly upon a cross. He says, For this reason the Father loves me, in John 10, 17. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. He says, No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down of my own initiative. Jesus was not murdered. He laid down his life, and this willingly as an expression of love. And he was judged for all of our sin, all of our sin, not some of it, past, present, and future, because all of our sin was future from the time of the cross. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, for, for by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the, through the body through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He goes on, he says, every priest, speaking of the uh, Mosaic law code, the sacrificial system and the priestly duties, he says, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. In other words, the Old Testament sacrificial system didn't take away sins, it only covered it from the use of the Hebrew verb kafar, which means to cover. But Jesus came actually to remove sin, to take it away. This is called the doctrine of expiation, in which he actually removes the sin. It is actually gone. It is actually removed from you. Even the sin you continue to produce has already been judged on the cross. Verse 12 of Hebrews 10, But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And so Jesus willingly died on a cross, was judged for our sin, and was buried and raised to life on the third day. So it wasn't just that he died and was buried, but he came to life. He was resurrected. And 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died 
for our sins. And this is the idea of substitution, that he died in our place, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep, and he will never die again. Romans 6, 9 says, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Now, after his redeeming work, Jesus ascended to heaven, where he awaits his return. We think of the rapture as the next prophetic event to occur. John 14, 1 through 3, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, Titus 2, 13, uh, all make this quite clear. And Jesus' work uh, upon the cross opens the way for us to have forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1, 7 says that in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And Ephesians 1, 3 talks about our spiritual life and the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. In which he writes, uh, Paul says in Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And we've been born again. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to what? To a living hope. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And this wonderful life is offered to us. This forgiveness, this eternal life, this righteousness is offered to us if we simply turn to Christ as our Savior. When the Philippian jailer in Acts 16.30 asked the Apostle Paul, what must I do to be saved? Paul gave one simple answer. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believing in Christ means we turn from trusting in anyone or anything as having any saving value, which is, by the way, the meaning of repentance. It's a change of mind. We, we change our mind from trusting in anything or anyone as having any saving value. And we place our complete confidence or trust in Christ alone to save, accepting him and his work on the cross as all that is needed to have eternal life. Salvation comes to us by grace alone, and grace from the Greek word katos, which means undeserved or unmerited favor. In other words, we don't deserve it. It's an undeserved gift. It comes to us by grace alone, through faith alone, because it doesn't add any works. And by the way, faith doesn't save. Christ saves. Faith merely becomes the channel or the means or the instrument by which we receive that. But salvation comes to us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Because Christ is the only one who saves. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, uh, so that no one may boast. God also promises us eternal existence with him uh, in heaven, uh, who will eventually create a new heavens and earth, which will be marked by perfect righteousness. So you think about this in contrast to the statements by, by Twain and Russell, who say there is no hope, and that life is meaningless, and you go through life and it amounts to nothing. Well, that's not the biblical teaching. The Bible teaches very clearly that according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You see, for a Christian, there's the we have hope, hope in the future, that God will restore everything as it was at the beginning. And we have purpose and meaning in life right now, right now, because Christ has borne our sin and we have entered into a relationship with God through faith in Christ, and all of our sins are forgiven, and we're given eternal life, we're given the gift of righteousness, we are transferred from Satan's domain of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved Son, we have a, a new sense of identity that we are said to be in Christ, uh, we have a sense of purpose in this world, we are children of the living God, we are brothers and sisters to the King of kings and Lord of lords, 
and we have a purpose in this world uh, because of our relationship with God through Christ. Now, God has already, uh, and by the way, at a future time, we will be free from sin and death. Now, God has already begun this restoration process, and this starts with the restoration of lost sinners to himself and progressing uh, toward the complete and perfect restoration of the universe and earth. If we accept God and his offer of salvation, then we have a new relationship with him. And this means that we are part of his royal family. God also gives meaning to our lives and calls us to serve uh, as his representatives in a fallen world. To reject God and his offer is to choose an eternal existence away from him in the lake of fire. This is avoidable. It's all avoidable. The lake of fire is avoidable. If one turns to Christ as Savior, believing the good news that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried and raised again on the third day. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Christ died for you? That he was buried and raised again on the third day, never to die again? And that if you will trust in him, and trust in him alone, and don't trust in any in yourself or anyone or any works of your own to save you. Man needs only Christ to be saved. And to turn to him and to trust in him and him alone is all that we need for eternal life. So I ask you, <laughs> won't you trust in Christ as your Savior and begin this new and wonderful life? I pray that you do. So this closes out this lesson for today. I hope that this has been helpful to you. I know the material has been uh, um, perhaps a little uh, deeper than perhaps what a lot of us are accustomed to dealing with. I wrestled with these issues some years ago, and I must admit it was a bit heavy and challenging at times, and I've tried to take the material and to present it in a condensed form uh, that's understandable, and we've touched on it lightly. Hopefully the books that I've recommended um, by Dr. Sire and by, uh, by Dr. Francis Schaefer will help unpack this for you more and more. And I do, in closing, recommend again the book, How Should We Then Live? The Rise and Decline of Western Thought and Culture by Dr. Francis Schaefer, and the video series as well. A very, very uh, good um, set of lessons to watch. So I will close that out. I hope that you have enjoyed this lesson. And if you did, please hit the like button below. And if you enjoyed this lesson and would like to receive others like it, then please subscribe to my channel. I thank you very much, and I wish you a good day.